the main reason why people have a hard time accepting the fact that women can be abusive is because of the, the language that we use when we talk about domestic violence and those, the images that come up in the mind when we talk about domestic violence and in, intimate partner abuse or battering. All those terms generally bring to mind a guy you know, overpowering his wife with, with his fist. The gender paradigm is the, the it, it's the assumption that domestic violence is about male uh, violence against women. And uh, the gender paradigm um, is an assumption that's completely untrue. It's completely false, completely. If half of domestic violence is perpetrated by women and uh, people deny that, and so what are we supposed to do with these women who are violent, uh, who are abusing their kids, who are abusing their husbands? Uh, if they don't exist, well then, <laughs> when, if we think that they don't exist, then we're not dealing with the problem. We're only dealing with half the problem uh, and that's, to me, that's something that, that is just uncalled for. In the countries where research has been conducted and we know about the rates of violence, the g rates of violence are generally comparable between men and women all over the world. In some countries, they're somewhat higher by men, okay? But y you would think that in a place like Iran or, you know, Jordan, uh, these highly patriarchal countries, that the rates of violence would be much higher by men and they are somewhat higher by men, but not as high as you think. So basically what that shows is that domestic violence is a human problem. John Hamel, licensed clinical social worker, has a master's in social welfare from UCLA and a PhD from the University of Central Lancashire Psychology Department, UK. He has conducted batterer intervention and parent programs in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1992. John is founder and executive director of the Association of Domestic Violence Intervention Programs, a nonprofit international organization of domestic violence treatment providers and domestic violence researchers. He is the author, editor, or co-editor of several books on family violence, and is editor-in-chief of the peer-reviewed professional journal, Partner Abuse, published quarterly by Springer Publishing. He regularly speaks at conferences on domestic violence theory, research and practice, and has provided consultation and training to mental health professionals, victim advocates and shelter workers, social service organizations, teachers, attorneys, judges, and law enforcement officers. He has also provided expert witness testimony. John, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, it's my pleasure. So I've been looking forward to this for some time. Um, this is a topic that on this podcast we haven't really covered all too much, uh, but there, it's a very rich field with a lot to a lot of ground to cover. So I hope we can um, we can go deep into it. Um, the first thing I wanted to just ask you is about the recent conference that we hosted in Toronto, which was the International Men and Families Conference um, in partnership with uh, Susan Chuang, the researcher. And you spoke at that conference. I did. It was great. Really enjoyed yeah, it. So I was just curious, what were your impressions of this event? Because for the audience that doesn't know, it was heavily focused on intimate partner violence. And uh, there was a lot of speakers from Canada, U.S., international, exploring uh, the topic from many angles. So what did you think about the event? Well, first of all, on a personal level, it, it was uh, very rewarding for me to get a chance to meet and talk with people that I have had, I've worked with professionally, but only remotely, and uh, who I only knew from, uh, you know, exchanges of emails. So, uh, for example, uh, Alexandra Lysova uh, is a professor at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. Oh, I guess it's in Burnaby, uh, right, British Columbia. And I, she actually co-wrote a chapter with me that's in my new book, and I'd never met her before, and she was really delightful. Uh, I'm gonna ha I'm gonna have her help me on another project. Uh, I had a chance to sit and talk extensively with Denise Hines, who is one of the leading researchers on uh, on abused men, someone I've known for years but never had a chance to really talk with in depth. Uh, ben Benjamin Hine from the UK is another researcher I, I've known for years who. I had a chance to finally get to know personally. So it was very rewarding for me on that level. 
Uh, I thought uh, all the speakers that I, I heard were wonderful. The focus was on domestic violence and, it, and mostly in terms of child custody, family law, uh, as opposed to criminal law. Uh, there was more of an emphasis on, uh, on uh, how to refute false allegations or distorted allegations of domestic violence. Um, I was very happy with, I'd never been to Toronto before. I enjoyed being in Toronto. I enjoyed being at the conference. It was a wonderful experience. I thought it was very professionally done. It was uh, minor technical problems as you can always uh, anticipate at any conference. But other than that, I think Susan was very, um, uh, was very uh, competent and uh, uh, in putting this thing together. And I, I think it went really well. I just hope that uh, they can do it again. Well, that's great to hear. I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I think she's already planning next year's event now. She's quite a um, action oriented person and very enthusiastic. So I believe she's, she's like got... a tornado. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Um, I was a virtual guest at the conference. I was just listening to as many speakers as I could. Um, and there was a lot of interesting facts and, and stories, also personal stories, you know, from male yes. victims of intimate partner violence uh, about what they had gone through, their suffering. And so both from a statistical academic yeah. perspective and from a very personal, emotional perspective, there was a lot of content. There was one, uh, one guy that I, whose story I heard uh, uh, mostly in full, um, pretty gut-wrenching sexual allegations that were completely unfounded. And even though they were dismissed, uh, according to Canadian law, I can still stay on this record forever it was pretty pretty sad to hear that yes yeah it was indeed so uh we hope that next year we get an even bigger audience and we continue to grow the event um what i want to do maybe to start off the conversation with you here is ask you about um what you describe as the gender paradigm because in in several of the books that you've written in your uh academic publications in the podcast, in video recordings, in many, many occasions, you've talked about the gender paradigm with intimate partner violence. And uh, for the audience that's listening right now, can you describe what this is and how it shapes um, both how, you know, uh, psychologists and social workers view the issue and how the police views the issue and the general public? Well, the gender paradigm, I think, was coined by my colleague, Don Dutton, who's also, who is another Canadian I'm actually an American from from uh, Montreal. When I say another Canadian, I, you're Canadian, correct? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Don Dutton, at formerly at University of uh, British Columbia, I believe he's the one who coined the term the gender paradigm. A paradigm is a general way of perceiving the world, um, and the gender paradigm is the the it, it's the assumption that domestic violence is about male. Uh, violence against women. And uh, the gender paradigm um, is an assumption that's completely untrue. It's completely false, completely. Uh, yes, of course, there are many men who, who are violent towards their female partners, but lots of women are violent towards their, their male partners as well. So the problem with the gender paradigm is that it, um, well, number one, it's uh, certainly not fair to uh, men who uh, are falsely accused or who assume to be or assume to be guilty and in various you know he said she said uh, situations where the police and others just figure that well he must be the guilty one um, the assumption they the, the gender paradigm um, is contrary to American law where one is presumed to be innocent until proven guilty. So it's not only unfair to men; it's it's really a, it's contrary to principles of uh, of e equality be before the law. Furthermore, it it um, has restricted the ability of people like myself, uh, intervention providers, from properly doing our job. Think about it: if half of domestic violence is perpetrated by women, and uh, people deny that, and so what are we supposed to do with these women who are violent? Uh, who are abusing their kids, who are abusing their husbands. Uh, if they don't exist, well then, <laughs> when, if we think that they don't exist, then we're not dealing with the problem. We're only dealing with half the problem. Uh, and that's, to me, that's something that, that is just uncalled for. 
Yeah. And by the way, let me just say this, and lest anyone think I'm some kind of right wing, uh, you know, nutcase. I'm a I'm a staunch, staunch feminist uh, from the 1960s. I grew up in the 1960s. Uh, beginning in the 1960s, I was uh, I wasn't that active, but I would say uh, my my I was anti-war. I was uh, liberal. I still am. Uh, I've always been on the side of the little guy, social justice, um, and that includes the rights of women. Uh, I was a strong supporter of second wave feminism, and I still am today. Uh, I acknowledge that uh, for about two to three hundred thousand years, men have pretty much dominated uh, in the world and much of the world today that remains the case. So men also uh, engage in the vast majority of physical violence outside the home. All these, all these things are true. But when it comes to in the home, it's just a fact that women are as violent as men. The main difference is that because men on the whole are, are bigger and stronger, they tend to cause more damage. They also tend to be scarier. So there's a, there's a somewhat of a different dynamic between violence by men on, on women and, and the reverse. There are differences, obviously. Uh, but that's, that's a far cry from, from denying the fact that women can be violent. Right. Um, and I think that nobody would deny that there are some very violent men that cause a lot of damage to, to both men and women and children. Um, but to deny that female violence is even possible to me requires a certain kind of mental gymnastics that I can't fathom in, in a certain way, like just my own two cents on the, on the topic is it's kind of a form of sexism against women. If you believe women are not capable of violence then you you're saying that they're a different kind of human being from men like they're not it's almost treating them as if they are innocent children as opposed to human adults with all the same capacity for good and evil that men have so that, that's correct that, i mean it's a possible way to look at it i know not everyone sees it like that that's exactly how i look at it that's exactly how i look at it um so uh, you mentioned in your introduction that i'm the editor-in-chief of a social science journal, it's called Partner Reviews. We have, I think, somewhere around 60 to 65 members on our editorial board. Editorial board. I would say about 40 out of the 65 are women. And I'm pretty certain that all of them are feminists. Maybe one or two would claim that they're not, but I think they're claiming not to be feminists in comparison to third wave modern feminists that sometimes can can advocate some pretty extreme positions, but generally the way we, the way most people think of feminism, which is the cry for equality for women in the, in the social sphere and, and legal matters and so forth, economically uh, and so forth. Um, I, I, I don't know of anyone that, that I've ever worked with, no researcher I've ever worked with is not a feminist. Um, so these women are all feminists. They're all college educated, smart women um, and, uh, but they're also really good researchers and the, and they believe in the facts. And so, um, uh, when I, when I see a, an article written by someone that identifies themselves as feminist, I know right away that it's going to be a lot of BS. It's just how it is. Um, so, uh, if I read an article by someone that says they're a feminist, generally, uh, I'm going to see the gender paradigm in all its glory. Um, why is it necessary for, um, for an individual to, to announce their political ideology when they're writing a social science paper? It's like a chemist, you know, or a botanist saying, I'm a, I'm a feminist botanist, or, a, you know, I'm a feminist ke chemist. It, it, it makes no sense whatsoever. Uh, the facts are the facts. Uh, you know, when, when these women who spend, I'm talking about the psychologists, my colleagues who are, who are women who work in the field of domestic violence and who uh, are knowledgeable about domestic violence the way I am and who, you know, rail against the gender paradigm constantly. People like Alexandra Lysova and Nicola, Nicola Graham Kevin and, and, and others like them, Denise Hines and so forth. Um, yes, they've told me 
you know, many times on many occasions that they they just can't stand uh, the way that women are seen in the uh, by better women's advocates. That better women's advocates do reduce women, as you say, to almost like an infantile status as being so uh, so helpless. Um, and it's really insidious. It's not just that women are seen as victims at all times, which of course takes away their agency. Um, but the motives ascribed to women who are violent are that these women are doing are are are, are hitting their partners in self-defense. They're reacting to the men, or they're expressing anger. So when men are violent, it's supposed to be because they're trying to control their partners either to maintain male privilege, which of course is nonsense. Some men, you know, some men do, may be so motivated, but that's not the primary, primary motivation for most domestic violence. It, it's generally either a result of the of an escalated conflict or it's the way an individual operates because of their particular personality structure. Um, generally it has nothing to do with patriarchy or anything like that. Uh, but According to better women's advocates and the scholars, quote unquote, who uh, expound the gender paradigm, when women are violent, it's um, it's it's because they're just expressing their anger. They can't possibly be wanting to control their partner. So think about that. Uh, the idea that <laughs> no woman would ever use violence as a way to control her partner. Why? Because so, I guess women don't have any agency. So my question, when I give presentations on domestic violence, I often pose the question, um, do we want to go back to the 1950s? Yes or no? Because if women are that helpless, why are they wanting to be CEOs and CFOs of corporations? Why can we trust them to be politicians and to, uh, and to lead us? Uh, why would we ever elect a woman president of the United States if women are helpless little creatures? So there, obviously there's a, there is a contradiction there. Basically, the better women's advocates are saying women are completely capable of doing all the things that men do, except in the home, uh, they're completely helpless. And of course, that's an absurd, it's an untenable and absurd proposition. If you're asking me, why do they say those things? My opinion is that a lot of, let me put it this way, young women who been going to liberal college colleges and maybe just are beginning to work to volunteer, let's say at a shelter. Um, I would say that young woman is getting a liberal education, probably a heavy dose of liberal politics. Um, generally colleges or professors at colleges tend to be pretty liberal. In fact, more than just liberal, pretty almost, you know, radical. Especially um, so, in the, um, sorry, the social sciences and humanities departments. I think yeah. they're very concentrated in those. A little yeah. bit less in the, in some of the hard sciences. Um, but yes, you're correct. Yeah. Well, so a young woman, let's say, who's got a liberal education and, uh, let me see, say, volunteers at a shelter or gets her master's degree and decides to work at some agency, um, and starts working with women who have been abused, the combination of her education, uh, which is going to be very left wing uh, and all that that entails, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm pretty left wing myself, but the, 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 the way that gender is, 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 is thought of and the role of women in society tends to, can be pretty uh, extreme as propounded in some universities, right? So if a young woman has the combination of those theories that she's been subjected to, and then is working with only battered women, only women who have been abused severely, then if you, when you bring a battered man or domestic violence against men, it's not gonna compute. They're just not, they hadn't thought about that. It didn't occur to them, unless their dad or their uncle or somebody they know has been abused, in which case they'll make up, maybe make up their own mind. So it's a combination, for young people, it's a combination of, of ignorance and uh, it's just a matter of trying to educate them. Now, the feminists who've been around for a while, especially the ones that work in the field, know better. Uh, and in my opinion, the vast majority of, of uh, battered women's advocates who've been around for a while and who still 
uh, refuse to uh, believe that women can be violent or who seriously minimize the problem, I think are doing so for political reasons and for self gain. Um, you know, it's just a matter if you are the, if you've been working at a shelter or you're the head of a shelter, you're the, you're the public, um, uh, say the public, the marketing director, or you, you, you're working with the press for a particular organization, and this is your job, this is what you've been doing. Um, you're, there's a lot, you have kind of a vested interest in towing the party line. Uh, and I just think there's a lot of a willingness to not listen and a willingness to, uh, to uh, shut your shut your eyes when it's convenient to do so, so I would say mm -hmm. a, a combination of of, um, of ignorance and a combination of just straight up being in denial and lying, <laughs> yeah, for political and self uh, selfish reasons. So I think that's thank you for that explanation. It's it's very true that it's become a politicized topic. Not all aspects of of gender relations are are political, but this one uh, starting kind of in the 70s, it seems like it took a turn in one direction. Um, that reminds me of the du Duluth model, which I know you're familiar with. And the Duluth model, was it Ellen Pence who was the founder of this? Um, I heard actually, and, and this is the kind of power and control wheel, which is uh, highly connected to the theory of patriarchy, that men have all the power and control in the world, and they use violence as an instrument to exercise it to keep women basically in their place. That's what they're kind of saying with this model. Um, but it, she even herself admitted at some point in time later that it did not reflect the reality for most intimate partner violence cases. And yet in many states and counties and cities, including in Canada, Australia, UK, like it's gone beyond, well beyond the United States. It is the dominant paradigm for how law enforcement, courts, uh, and other practitioners, social workers view intimate partner violence is that it's this one way direction, male on female, male aggressor, female victim. They don't see the, the reverse, but also the, what's a puzzle to me is how do they explain uh, same sex IPV under the Duluth model? Like if a man uh, in a gay partnership hits another man or it's a lesbian couple, you know, where, where is patriarchy fitting into that? Well, amongst the uh, the four general subgroups related to sexual orientation, you would have gay, straight straight men and women, uh, uh, gay men and uh, and lesbians. Lesbians uh, engage in the highest levels of domestic violence. So riddle me that, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's just national intimate. Partner in Sexual Violence Survey, which was conducted about 10 years ago in the United States, is the largest uh, social science survey of domestic violence um, and the, the most accurate um, battered women's advocates cited all the time. I cited all the time. It's pretty clear that lesbians engage in the highest levels, of not, you know, not a whole lot, not twice as much as, you know, others, but significantly higher. So th yes, that does pose a conundrum, doesn't it? To be fair, there has been an evolution, and uh, so the the gender paradigm has shifted a little bit. It's, I now call it the gender paradigm light, and uh, so initially the gender paradigm, the assumption was that um, men abuse women. This is the Duluth model. Men abuse women as a as a way to maintain their male privilege. Uh, that has changed. So now most better women's advocates. Most of them will say, we understand that men who are violent towards their partners do so for various reasons. It's, it probably has a lot to do with the way they grew up, their childhood of origin, their personality, and so forth. And we understand that, that many women are violent too for the same reasons. It's just that um, it's, it happens so much more often by men as opposed to women. And as I said before, Warren, uh, the view is that women, when they're violent, it's either in self-defense or it's because they're angry and they're just taking out, they're taking out their frustrations as opposed to trying to control their partner. And that's completely wrong. So it's, so the paradigm has shifted a little bit, uh, but of course it's still not in line with the facts as we know them. Um, mm -hmm. The reason why it's, it's hard for people to admit to, uh, to uh, the high levels of violence by women is 
is many fold. I mean, number one, uh, the way I'll, I'll just tell you the main reason. This is my theory. The main reason why people have a hard time uh, accepting the fact that women can be uh, abusive is because of the, the language that we use when we talk about domestic violence and those, the images that come up in the mind when we talk about domestic violence and in, intimate partner abuse or battering. All those terms generally bring to mind a guy you know, overpowering his wife with, with his fist. That's the image that we tend to have. If you, all the movies that have ever been made on domestic violence, you know, it's about some guy who's extremely controlling and possessive and jealous, who either is beating his wife or threatening to beat her with his fist. You know, the posters that you see, the anti-domestic violence posters, show typically a woman cowering in the corner with a guy standing over her. So when, when I bring up the notion that there's a lot of women who are abusive, that doesn't seem to, that it's hard for people to reconcile what I just said with those images. So what, what, I, what I found to be very helpful is to give, in, instead of just giving out the, uh, the facts and, and citing the research and the, the statistics, uh, I try to incorporate in my presentation some anecdotes. You were referring to uh, the conference and there was some really good uh, speakers who talked about their own victimization. And so I tried to throw in some anecdotes. So for example, I worked one time with this man in private pra my private practice here in California as a therapist, client was uh, coming to see me because he was stressed out. He was losing, he had lost his job as a CFO for a large company uh, because he was so stressed out and he had been abused by his girlfriend. Now he said, you know, she, he believed that she had a borderline personality disorder, not a psychiatrist. I'm not sure how accurate his diagnosis was, but the way he described her, she very well could have been a, someone with that kind of personality. But the way he described her was she was very jealous, very possessive. She was constantly calling him names. She was constantly calling him during the day. Um, she would uh, routinely hit him, slap him. Uh, he described uh, an, an incident where about three o'clock in the morning, she woke, him, she woke him up. She had found, uh, I guess, she looked at his phone and found some, some, his ex-wife had texted him and she wanted to know what was going on and she wound up hitting him. It's so around three o'clock in the morning and she's hitting him and screaming at him and he's like, so he was holding her by the wrist and he was strong enough to keep her from really hurting him. So she scratched up his face, but she, did, she wasn't able to overpower him, okay? So here's the important thing to know. She wasn't able to overpower him. He as the man was stronger and was able to keep her uh, from, from really harming him. Okay, but this went on for a couple of hours. So unless you've actually been attacked by somebody at three o'clock in the morning, scratching up your face and screaming at you, um, you know, you're, you're gonna, you know, don't make assumptions about how this person might feel. Because I think it's, if you were in that kind of situation, you would feel stressed out. You wouldn't be a human being if you didn't. So the man finally, you know, lost his job and he was, you know, he, he had a really tough time. So I, when I, when I point out in my talks, I, I, I point out or I cite these kinds of of examples and I say, look, female batterers uh, are not exactly the, the same as male batterers. Now some are, I mean, there are women who are pretty big and strong and they can actually overpower their, their male partners. There are examples of that, certainly. Women who are 200 pounds or no martial arts, and sure, they can actually beat their partners into submission, but that's the exception. The majority of female, what we call female batterers, that is to say, uh, women who like the male counterparts are highly controlling, they have an aggressive personality, um, either an antisocial type of personality or a borderline type of personality. Um, they, they don't overwhelm their partners with, with, with violence and they don't force their, their partners into submission just strictly through the, the threat of force or through the use of force. It's a combination of verbal and psychological abuse and then other types of threats, like threats to take away the children. Um, the man whose, whose girlfriend or wife is extremely abusive and controlling never knows when she's gonna call him a piece of shit in front of their kids, when she's going to make fun of his sexual performance uh, in front of their friends, when she's gonna call the police on him with some bogus allegation of domestic violence, um, when is she gonna file for divorce and take the kids there are all kinds of ways that abusive women can scare and intimidate men that don't involve 
the use for threats of physical violence. So once I explain that to people and I give them anecdotes, they get it. Um, because most people know somebody in their family or somebody at work, or a friend uh, who's male who's been abused by their girlfriend or their wife, and generally are sympathetic to it. So when I discuss domestic violence within it with people, I try to avoid loaded terms like violence, uh, battering, uh, victims. Most men don't think of themselves as victims. So I, I usually ask them about, their, about behaviors that they've engaged in or behaviors where... Uh, that their partner is engaged in. So did your girlfriend ever, you know, uh, abuse you? I don't know, I guess. She yelled at me. Uh, did she ever punch you? Oh, yeah, all the time. You see what I'm saying? So when we asked uh, men who had been abused about specific behaviors, uh, and by the way, when you ask this man on the street, anybody, the average person about specific behaviors that they've engaged in or they know that their friends have engaged in, uh, you can get a lot more information than if you ask loaded questions like, uh, you know, uh, are you in a domestically violent relationship? So uh, so the, there's a bunch of reasons why the problem is minimized. Part of it is that it's the way we think about domestic violence as we, we have these examples from the movies. Uh, but part of it is also is um, I've had colleagues say, you know, I, I completely understand, John, that uh, women are just as violent as men. But you know what? Men have dominated women for 250,000 years. So, you know, the pendulum is swinging the other way. So who cares? Yeah. Um, and this, it reminds me of an article that you sent me recently. Uh, this was published in Partner Abuse in 2020. And the title of your article was Explaining Symmetry Across Sex in Intimate Partner Violence, Evolution, Gender Roles, and the Will to Harm. So in this, you, you go into these uh, theories of why people become violent. And you said that the you know, the patriarchal power and control, it's not actually very useful in explaining the kinds of people who become violent, um, nor is the way a person votes, you know, conservative, liberal or whatever. Like there are people of all across the spectrum and all genders and all ages who can be victims or perpetrators of violence. Yeah. But you said in this, uh, you offered the, the ideas that um, individual personality individual childhood experiences and relationship factors are better explanations. Yeah. Uh, things like attachment theory, I guess this is kind of John Bowlby's work, right? And yeah. social learning right. theory. So people who with more insecure attachment patterns uh, tend to be a little bit higher in the likelihood of committing violence. Um, but it has to do with the individual. It's not a, a clear line drawn between the genders, right? Right. Um, now, in terms of... Uh social factors versus individual factors. You know, I'm not saying that uh, social mores and politics and uh, on that level has nothing to do with uh, domestic violence. Uh, so let me give you an example. In much of the world, um, there aren't any laws uh, against domestic violence or the laws that exist are not enforced. So in much of, much of Africa, Asia and South America, um, there are very few, if any, better women's advocate, advocacy groups. Um, now, it's the case in, in most countries that rates of violence are very comparable. They just are. With, with few exceptions, the violence, domestic violence rates are about the same in China, in uh, most of the southern part of Africa, in the Caribbean, in many countries in Latin America. In the countries where research has been conducted and we know about the rates of violence, the rates of violence are generally comparable between men and women all over the world. In some countries are somewhat higher by men, okay? But you would think that in a place like Iran or, you know, Jordan, uh, these highly patriarchal countries, that the rates of violence would be much higher by men. And they are somewhat higher by men, but not as high as you'd think. So basically what that shows is that domestic violence is a human problem. And behind closed doors, women in Saudi Arabia and women in Iran hit, hit their men and slap their men the way the men do. Now, here's the difference. Uh, if it's a patriarchal society and women don't have the same rights as men, then women are much more constrained in their ability to get help and to get justice legally, right? They're less likely to, 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 to find protection when they're seriously in danger of being killed, for example. So... 
um, I would say that um, if I was, you know, if I was working in Iran, uh, I, I would have a different approach to the way I, I discuss domestic violence. I would put a little bit more of an emphasis on the social factors. Because here in the United States and Canada, um, the, the women's liberation movement has had a great success. Women are generally not uh, facing the same kind of legal and social obstacles that they once did. Women can, can and do um, seek legal protection uh, and it's available to them. But so that's the caveat. I'm, no one's saying that social factors are not important. They are important, but not as important as better women's advocates would say. I'll give you another example. It's assumed, not only in the United States, but especially in patriarchal countries, that most people approve of domestic violence. Not true. I've looked at the research. I know what the research says. In only one country, and that's, I think, Jordan, does a majority of the population approve of violence by the husband or the wife under cer certain circumstances? So the question is, is it okay for a, a husband to slap his wife if she didn't cook him dinner on time? I think in Jordan, I think something like 48 or 50 percent of the people said, yeah, it's, it's okay. But in majority of, in almost every other country, it's somewhere around 10 to 30 percent. So like 10 to 30 percent of people think it's okay for, um, for a husband to hit or slap his wife. And this is primarily in the really the most patriarchal countries. So even in the most patriarchal countries, vast majority of individuals don't believe that's okay. Now, let's separate attitudes about domestic violence and uh, rates of domestic violence from the, the conditions of women in these countries. So the condition of women in these countries, some of these countries is totally atrocious, it's abysmal. But here's the thing, in, this, in that article you referenced, um, I was just trying to show why is it that, that there's such a disparity between rates of violence in the home and outside the home. Because in the home, this is uh, one area where women traditionally and, can, and all around the world feel is their domain. You have a vested interest. They have, an, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, um, women are going to defend their interests zealously in the home, the way that men defend their interests uh, outside the home in competition with other men in job seeking and in war and so forth. So, um, so, if, uh, so women tend to have certain assumptions. In the United States, for example, there's something called female privilege, which is the, which not all women subscribe to, but it's the, it's the uh, equivalent to male privilege. So male privilege is, well, I'm the, I'm the breadwinner I'm the father, you should have my dinner ready. I don't want you working outside the home. You know, you take care of the kids. You know, I'll, 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 I'll call the shots when it comes to how we spend our money and so forth. Well, female privilege is, um, I'm the mom, I know better, I'll take care of the kids. Um, if we get divorced, I'll get the kids. Uh, if I hit you, I should be okay because you're a guy and you can take it. Uh, by the way, I want a bigger house with more bedrooms, so I want you to get another job. And if you, uh, and if you cross me and I divorce you, I'll show the court that because you haven't been around and you've been working three jobs for me, you're not a fit father and I'll take the kids and then you'll pay incredible child support to support me the rest of my life. Now, I, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but there are actually you know, lots of women who have that mentality, right? So, um, so in the home, women have more of an interest in, in, in maintaining their, their privilege and, and uh, than men do. I'm not saying all women think that way or, or act that way. You know, my wife certainly doesn't. Um, but um, but that's one explanation for why you find high rates of violence in the home uh, all around the world. Let me say one more thing. Uh, I've given a lot of thought to this topic, and uh, especially when I was researching domestic violence worldwide, and I was quite amazed at the high rates of violence against men worldwide. And then it occurred to me. Sometimes the, the best way to understand domestic violence is just to kind of like uh, get your head out of the, the books and just use your common sense. Just use your common sense. Like, why aren't there more men beating the hell out of their wives in Pakistan when they can? Like, they can't, right? There's no, the laws are really not enforced. So why can't a, a guy in Pakistan just beat his wife mercilessly every day? Because it's not in his interest to do so. First of all, if you think that, or if you even propose that question, you're assuming that most men or all men are violent or have violent tendencies, which is wrong. 
So the average man in Pakistan is a nice guy who just wants to you know, get along with his wife. And it's not in his interest to hurt his wife because then she's going to withdraw love. His self-respect will, will suffer. His children will hate his guts. There, there's a price to be paid for being violent. And the assumption by some of these feminists and uh, battered women's advocates is that men are just inherently violent. Give them any opportunity to be violent and they're going to be violent. And that's such an absurd, uh, in many ways, degrading kind of uh, point of view. So those of us who, you know, call in question the gender paradigm, point these things out. These are just the facts. M around the world, most people don't approve of domestic violence. Uh, women are violent all around the world for the same reason as women in the United States. It's to defend their interests in the home. Um, it's their way of exercising their power in countries where they can't exercise their power in other ways. It's just really quite simple. Yes, um, and that that's a very good explanation. I think that, uh, you know, the, the all of the huge research that you have compiled, uh, and I want to get into the PASC project. Uh, we'll come to this next because that's a really, really important thing to mention. The Partner Abuse State of Knowledge yeah. Project. Um, but all of that data that is available online for free on, on your site, like Erin Pitsy knew this back in the 70s when she opened the first women's refuge in the United Kingdom. Uh, she saw within the first hundred uh, people that she took, uh, female victims of domestic violence, into her shelter, that at least half of them or more were as violent or more violent than the husbands that they were fleeing from. So uh, That's correct. Like, way back at the you know during second wave feminism uh when the the kind of uh you know the the talk of patriarchy and male dominance and male privilege and all that was really starting to ramp up uh there was already evidence at that time that it wasn't quite as one-sided as as the radical feminists were talking about it was actually more complex and yes there are violent men but that doesn't mean all men are violent right and even if even if the majority of the worst types of violent crime are committed by men, that doesn't mean that all men are doing it, right? And I, to me, this Correct. is one of the biggest errors in, in perception and in uh, explanation of the world that people make is that, you know, uh, there's the apex fallacy and then there's the nadir fallacy. You know, it's like because the, all, most of the CEOs are men, therefore men have all the power in the world. Not true. Most men are... A lot of men are near the bottom. They're doing the worst kinds of work. They're not well paid for it. Uh, they die more often in the workplace, et cetera, et cetera. Like for every man that's at the top, there's a hundred or a thousand men at the well, very bottom. So yeah, you know, there's this, but on, yeah. on the violence side is that um, like it could be 2% or 5% of all the world's men who are doing the worst forms of violence. But it's just that that's what we notice and people extrapolate in their minds. They have these simple ideas that because we see this man who's a murderer, he's a rapist or he's an abuser of his wife, therefore all men. Right. They, they just extend it without really any kind of complex thought. And I think that's partly where the stereotypes come from. One is that. But the other reason I think to blame is television and films and and media stereotypes of the characters that we watch. That's correct. Aaron Pizzi uh, wrote a book called Violence Prone. It, it was published in 1982, and within like a month, it was banned in the UK. It was just banned. They stopped printing, and it was never reissued. The only way to get a copy of this book is you have to contact her. She can send you a PDF. So I read the book. This is a book. But she, had she had written a previous book called Be be quiet uh, uh, so the neighbors can't hear or something like that. Uh, I didn't read that book. That, that book was published. It was more of a straight up description of uh, the stories of these about her women. But violence prone, she attempted to explain what you just talked about, that there were a lot of these, a lot of these women had needs that went beyond just getting shelter. They had problems with their own violence and dysfunction. And, uh, and it was a great book. Uh, she, now, she describes it herself even today as an anti-feminist, she sees herself as a traditional woman, et cetera. So, you know, politically, I probably don't have a lot in common with Aaron Pizzi. Uh, however, Aaron Pizzi had a remarkable insight. Um, 
she she saw and she did had no idea she had no idea who John Bowlby was. You mentioned John Bowlby, mm-hmm. but she described the the patterns of of um, of abuse in these families and the inner generational transmission of abuse that she saw in these families, the way these women related to their husbands and their kids and the families they came from and correctly identified um, these uh, attachment patterns. And without using the term an- anxious things, an, uh, attachment or dismissing attachment style, she correctly identified these a- attachment problems in these families. And when she said these women were violence prone, what she was saying was the half of the women that engage in violence were violence prone because they grew up around abuse. They grew up amongst uh, around dysfunction. And so they took out their anger on their kids, sometimes their husbands. So, But the feminists picked up that phrase, violence prone, and they, I guess, assumed that she was saying that all women are prone to violence. I mean, that's... Um, so in 2008, I uh, sponsored a conference in California where I invited a number of the world's leading domestic violence, research, domestic violence researchers um, for a, conf- a one-day conference in Sacramento, California, and we invited Erin Pizzi. It's 2008, and she showed, she came, and it, she said, this is the first time I've talked in the United States in like 30 years. I was blown away. Like, in 30 years, you were never invited by any organization. You were a found, the founder of the first battered women's shelters. What did you do wrong? You took in... Uh, through your own generosity, because you cared about these women, you took these women to your own home, you spent years and years with your own money uh, helping these women, you at some point realized, gee, some of these women also have problems with anger, and the other shelters refused to take these women because they were too difficult. And this is the, one, of the, one of the facts about shelters that one of the dark secrets that's not often talked about is that um, most shelters, uh, and rightly so, I mean, will kick out women who are disruptive. And there are a lot of women who are abused by their husbands who need shelter, but they're just quite violent themselves. The difference between, the reason why they're in the shelter and not their husband is because simply their husbands are bigger and stronger. And when they duke it out, the husband wins. So they wind up in a shelter, but they're both quite violent. And, um, and rightly so, they have to be you know, uh, given the told, told you need to get out of here. Well, Erin Pizzi was willing to work with those women. She talks about in her book, Violence Prone, that, you know, it's not, these women really need help. No one wants them. Even the shelters don't want them, but I will work with them. So this is a woman who cared so much about other women and about um, better, better women in particular, that she was willing to stick her neck out and take in women who were really disruptive. There was no, there was no reason to do that other than she really cared about them. And for that, she's been vilified for 40 or 50 years. It's just uh, totally uncalled for, um, totally uncalled for. When I talk to my colleagues, my more skeptical you know, colleagues who either subscribe completely or at least partly to the gender paradigm, I, I, I just really try to point out that even if you don't care about men, even if you think, okay, it's, they're just desserts, it's been 300,000 years of patriarchy, you know, just the pendulum is swinging the other way. If you don't care about the man, care about the kids. Because every time mom screams at dad and calls him a loser, every time mom hits dad, throws things at dad, the children are learning that. They're watching her. And uh, the principles of learning theory and observational theory uh, indicate that when a child has witnessed a parent resolve a problem in a particular way, say being violent, they, they learn that, they internalize that. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on size and strength. It just depends on the behavior. Um, and, it's, and in fact, there's research showing that children who witness their mom being violent are just as likely as adults to be violent themselves, to have to be depressed, to have substance abuse problems, and so forth. Sometimes that gets their attention. Much, much of the time, they just deny it. They say, well, where's the research? And I say, well, go to the Partner Abuse Data Knowledge Project. And, Mm-hmm. Check it out. Yes, exactly. That's that's a great uh, great segue. But just before we go there, I want to say, Aaron Pizzi is not the only person who was vilified for speaking the truth. Murray Strauss is another one, which I believe uh, he was one of the early world experts on intimate partner violence. He he created a, a whole bunch of uh, you know explanatory frameworks and 
uh, there was an article in 2007, I think you have it linked on one of your sites, you also have a video of one of his presentations where he's speaking to a crowd. And he says this is that the there, Sacramento conference that I was uh, referring to. Yes, yes. Uh, he said there are um, around seven ways in which uh, researchers minimize the the appearance or the recognition of male victims of intimate partner violence. Um, so on the practitioner side, you know, when police show up to a house where the violence is happening, there's this kind of you know one directional limited uh, lens through which they view the situation, which is usually remove the man, arrest the man, regardless of who hit more, who hit first, etc. It's just they treat it this way. Um, the courts treat it the same way. But the researchers, they should know better. They should take a higher approach and, and look at the full picture. However, Murray Strauss was saying they quite often suppress evidence. They choose not to collect data that contradicts their pre-existing ideology. When they find that data, they will twist it or minimize or distort it. Um, they will they will describe the conclusions in ways that don't accurately fit with the data, the raw data that was collected. Um, and then they have these kind of echo chambers of evidence by citation. They will all just quote each other in various publications right. without right. without a lot of uh, new raw data being collected, and so on and so forth. Oh, and but actually, sorry, there's one important point I, f I, I forgot, which is that Murray Strauss received threats, like physical violence threats against yeah. him, yeah. merely for saying that uh, violence was not a one gender problem. It was a both right. gender problem. And That's he right. he received death threats. He was uh, disinvited from conferences. He was banned from all sorts of things. Well, you know, Warren, uh, I mean, it's not just in the field of domestic violence, I think my experience is that most people don't do subtlety very well. You, you're, you know that the United States has, the last several years there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of um, evidence that, that people are sort of you know retreating on their own side of things conservatives and liberals and so forth so I'm, I'm pretty traditionally liberal person and I have, but I have these ongoing conversations with, with my friends and uh, they just kind of you know I'll 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 say certain things that I, I think are just common sense. Like, um, why can't the Democrats running for president acknowledge that it's not okay to come here illegally and that we should have strong borders, but we should we should allow and in fact encourage legal immigration of people of color from around the world? What's wrong with that? Can't you just say that? Why do you have to dodge the questions? Um, it, when you're uh, when someone uh, when the the last uh, the last Supreme Court, uh, United States Supreme Court uh, nominee, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Stacey Jackson, was uh, questioned. She was asked once, uh, you know, what is a woman? And she couldn't give an answer. Really? You can't give an answer to that? Sometimes uh, I wonder uh, why people can't just be uh, honest about reality. And why, and why can't we just, you know, accept that sometimes... Uh, phenomena are complex and they can be looked at in different ways. And there, there's some truth and there's some, you know, some falsity to what people say. Um, in the area of domestic violence, it's replete with all kinds of, um, there's all kinds of complexities. Um, for example, it's true on the one hand that because men are bigger uh, and more imposing, they tend to have an advantage in an escalated conflict where the woman may feel a little bit intimidated. That might cause her to back off, to not speak her mind the way she might otherwise. On the other hand, uh, I mean, something that's not talked about very often, uh, men generally are constrained by the fact that you're not supposed to hit a woman. If you hit a woman, then you're some kind of loser. So men are constrained and sometimes will not be violent towards their partner just because it's not okay to hit a woman. So they'll let their partner hit them, but they won't respond. So the question is, well, then who has the advantage in these in in the high conflict situation where both partners are going back and forth and things are really escalating? Like, does somebody have more inherent power? And there's really no answer to that. There's there's no research that's been done that can that can conclusively decide that. You know, all, all we all we can say is that every situation is different. Um, another example of complexity would be the whole thing about fear. Restraining orders are easily obtained, especially by women, sometimes by men, when they just simply say, I'm afraid of my partner. Well, but 
Some people are afraid and have no reason to be afraid. We call them neurotic. So if, if somebody is, is afraid um, because their previous husband or boyfriend used to beat them and their current husband sometimes raises his voice a little bit, um, does that mean he's a batterer or does that mean that he's actually being threatening? So uh, the way that men and women relate to one another, the way that conflicts escalate and the different risk factors that inform people's behavior are really complex. And so we really can't reduce it to, you know, are women violent or are they not violent? It's more on a, on a, on a, on a gradient of low level abuse to, you know, higher level abuse. Um, I, I've been trying to make sense of this for 30 years and there's a lot of questions I just can't answer, but the, some of the simpler questions like, you know, are women violent and they're capable of doing a lot of harm? The answer is absolutely. And it's a, it's something that's not been treated very seriously. Um, I think that um, you, you, you see that, uh, you see that in, in the way that uh, reporters talk about the subject. Uh, one of my uh, favorite talking heads on TV is Ari Melber. He's uh, on MSNBC and he reports, uh, uh, he's an attorney and he reports on legal matters and really, one time someone brought up uh, male victims and he, his response was, well, I think men have plenty of rights. Someone was asking about men's rights and he goes, well, men have plenty of rights. And I thought, yeah, that's, yes, yes, men have plenty of rights. Okay, but in the area, of, in the family in the family court, men don't have so many rights. There, there are some areas in society where men just don't have a lot of rights and the family court is one of them, okay? Um, and I they don't even have, uh, sorry to interrupt, but I would okay. argue they don't even have the presumption of innocence in family court. No. You know, this is one of the, what Stephen Baskerville said, which I'm sure you disagree with him on many things. Uh, he comes from Ooh. a different place. Oh, it was a previous guest on the podcast. Uh, Stephen Baskerville is a political scientist. I don't know. Who um, but he was saying, like, on, on family court, the, it's the one branch of law where there, we don't have the presumption of innocence and the weighing of evidence. Uh, and the rules of evidence are not the same as in criminal court, where you have right. to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt, etc., in family court, someone can just say, I've been abused, and it's taken at face value. Well, to be fair, um, it's not quite that simple. I mean, uh, I, I do a lot of forensic work. Uh, let, me, let, me put a, let me sort of describe to you what generally happens, at least here in California. Let's say the, the, the mother says, um, I've been abused, and she'll have to make a declaration where she has to specify the abuse. Now, if she specifies that he threatened me, did all these things, if there's no third party evidence at all, and if the father has a decent legal team and has, you know, an uh, expert witness like myself, usually going to be okay. The problem is it might take months and months. And in the meantime, they may not get to see their kids very often. It's just the way that the courts work. So um, now, if the woman has, um, any evidence, even if it's just, the, if the evidence is that he was arrested, sometimes that's enough. Even if he was, was not charged, or if he was charged but not convicted, sometimes that's enough. You're right. That may just be enough to convince the judge that something happened. Uh, but it's not a slam dunk. It's not always like that. I mean, hmm. sometimes the men have a, a poor representation, or they can't find a, a witness like myself that knows what they're talking about. So they tend to just surrender and they accept, uh, you know, an arrangement where they see the kids, you know, every other weekend and that's, they could have done a lot better. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'll have to, I, that's not, I, I wouldn't agree that, that any time a woman makes any accusation, it's automatically believed. I think the tendency though is to act, is to err on the side of caution so that if, if the judge is not sure, they'll err on the side of caution and they'll tell the guy we'll have supervised visits for a few months. Now, on paper, that's not so horrible if we're erring the side of caution for the sake of the children, if there's uh, reasonable allegations, the children maybe should not be seeing that in a, you know, unsupervised for a while. The problem is that the attorneys manipulate things by, um, by dragging these things out indefinitely. And they come up with these, um, they, they keep filing new orders and they litigate 
And so what happens in, 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 in effect is that it might be months or years before a dad starts getting any kind of, of custody time because you know the best interest of the children and air on the side of caution mm -hmm. is the norm. So yeah, it, it tends to work that way. Uh, men have a, a serious disadvantage there. Now it's also true that some men who have a lot of money and are pretty charming in cases where the wives don't have such good reputation, sometimes we'll get over we'll get over on the wives. You know, it's not always the case that women are not, you know, in every case are uh, have the advantage. But I would say in general, you're right. They, the the presumption is that it, you know uh, that the man must be guilty, and uh, and we got to do something about it. So I try to put things in perspective. One of the questions I uh, I ask is um, is is taking the children away from dad going to solve more problems than it's, than it's causing? So if you take if the children are bonded to dad and they love dad and dad's not around and it's causing distress in the children, um, it, you could better make, you better have a good reason for doing that. It, it, in other words, it, it would be that if dad was around the children, he was causing um, so much harm that it's better to just take him away. So what is dad doing? If, mom, if, if dad shoved mom three years ago in an argument where the kids weren't even around, what does that have to do with current, uh, you know, current situation? So, yeah, so there is a balance. I think what you're, what you're coming to is like, we do need to look at the pros and cons of every option. And we shouldn't just take a one-sided view, but we should look at everything in context and make a reasonable uh decision looking at things in context yeah in uh i i just uh, my new book just came out i it has i think 15 chapters three or four of them are focused on family law and myself my 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 co-authors uh and my my colleagues who contributed to that 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 section we try very hard to present a very balanced uh, point of view about what goes on in the family court system, but we just couldn't help but point out the reality that in general, you know, men are presumed to be guilty. Um, the attorneys, the attorneys in the family court system, and I kind of went on a rant in Toronto on this. I just felt particularly uh, squirrely that day. Uh, I, I, I just said they're kind of the lowest form of, of, of attorneys that just not all of them, but many of them are, are they drive these these um, cases where they just want to demonize the, the other parent. And uh, I, I understand that's that's often the, the parents themselves that that, you know, hire those attorneys who, who drive these uh, these arguments um, and uh, and these baseless or exaggerated uh, accusations. Um, but. Um, the only way to counter that is is by methodically and systematically uh, examining the cases I try to do when I do my forensic work, just point by point by point, refute all the allegations that come up. Now, a lot of these allegations are just, uh, on the face of it, absurd. But somehow the, the family court has, has managed to buy into certain phenomena that really don't exist as, as widely uh, as as they say. For example, uh, the idea of uh, this whole thing about coercive control, I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of cases where uh, the mother will claim that the father has ex exercised coercive control over her. Okay, that's the buzzword that the attorneys put in, in the, you know, the, 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 there's no way that these, these these mothers are writing these, these statements themselves. They are having help from it, their attorneys to get the wording correct. I, it's always the same wording. Uh, you know, he's engaged in coercive control. So what is he, what do they mean by that? Sometimes uh, the man is engaged in coercive control. He's physically keeping her from leaving the house. He's, he's chasing her down, bring her back from her friend's house or from the bar. He's texting her 50 times a day. And sometimes it's the husband doesn't want her to spend twenty thousand dollars on a new car that they can't afford, or the husband just says to her, "You know, I wish you didn't hang out with those those women. You know, I just don't like them." In other words, stating your preference 
or disagreeing may be seen as an example of course of control. Why? Because he's the man. If a man wants something and he tells you and you're afraid or you say you're afraid, well, then he's, he's controlling you. Well, of course, that's absurd on its face. But what I'm saying is that the, the, the judges and a lot of the people in the family court system are only too willing to buy into that. So where I come in is I'll say something like, you know, coercive control is that whole notion was brought up by Lenore Walker like 50 years ago in reference to women who had actually been beaten by their husbands. These guys are really controlling. And yes, these guys would engage in jealous monitoring, controlling of their space, um, controlling the money. If you don't give me sex, if you're, if you don't, if you're not nice to me, I'm not going to give you any money. You can't have access to the bank accounts. That's that's controlling behavior. That's coercive control. Um, kind of objecting to your wife going to the bars till three o'clock in the morning when you have young children and you have to go to work the next day is not coercive control. But amazingly, sometimes it's brought up that way. And I, so I think that my sense of, of the family court system, I think most of the individuals in the family court system, aside from the advocates, kind of intuitively know that a lot of these um, allegations are bogus, but nobody wants to be the one who is too flexible and allows a batterer to go loose. You know, they, everybody is worried about calling them out. So calling out the BS is really difficult to do. I'm, you know, I'm willing to do it, but of course I do it in a way that's respectful and in, in legal language. I can't go into court and tell the judge it is full of it, you know. Yeah. So there's almost, um, if you think of it scientifically, it's kind of, they're not so concerned at all about false positives, uh, but they're very concerned about false negatives. So the one exactly. true uh, husband who's abusing his wife um, that doesn't get caught, doesn't get arrested, doesn't have justice, they're far more concerned about him than the 10 or 100 men who were falsely accused or the with the you know the accusations were highly exaggerated and they went to jail when maybe all they needed was a little bit of they needed some therapy or counseling or family intervention right uh, but all that damage that's been done to those families is not weighed against the damage of letting the the guilty man continue to exist out there in the public yeah well it's a, the same thing goes for uh, uh, allegations of sexual abuse you yeah. know after the me too movement a lot of the big fish were caught, like, uh, you know, people with actual, actual histories of, of rape, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein, for example. And then other people who, you know, were, it was just a disagreement behind closed doors and, uh, you know, people's reputations are ruined forever. Uh, I will say this regarding, uh, you know, Aaron aside of caution. I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that if the mother, you know, says that my husband has hit me a number, number of times. I was afraid to go to the police. Um, and the allegations are somewhat credible. If, uh, for example, if she, had if she had called the police before and didn't just bring up these allegations for the first time in family court, but actually had made a police report in the past, um, if, if the guy has, has had um, some trouble with the law, let's say he has substance abuse problems. Okay, there's not a lot of hardcore evidence, but at least there's something there. So... Would I be okay with him at least for a few weeks or a month or so having some supervised visits? Yes. I think that you know, I think I think under those situation under those circumstances, maybe dad uh, should be uh, you know seeing the kids uh, with a supervised visitor. Here's the problem. The supervised visitors often uh, are not therapists. They can't really comment on what's really going on, the interaction between dad and the kids. Most of the time, um, the reports say dad and the kids are doing fine. They're playing, they're, you know. Well, if after a month, two months, three months, four months of reports showing that dad and the kids are doing fine, why, why are supervisors just continuing to go on? Typically, the mother will say, well, I'm still not sure that he, you know, he's going to be okay. Well, um, sorry, your feelings don't count here. What matters is, um, is dad really showing um, violent or aggressive behavior uh, in these supervised visitations? Are the kids showing evidence of being afraid of dad? If the kids are not showing any evidence of being afraid of dad in the sessions, and you don't have any real strong evidence to show that he's a batterer, 
uh, we, we've, at this point, we've done, uh, just my opinion, at this point, the court has done enough to err, err on the side of caution. Okay, we, we took a pause. We took the kids away from dad for a little while. We're observing them. They seem okay. End of story. But that's not how it works because in the family court system, the mom can keep going back to court and she can get a, uh, an injunction by just saying, you know, he yelled at me on the phone. I'm afraid of him. And they're, you know, so. Yeah. It, it's too easy it, for that. This is where it goes wrong. What's that? Um, it, it, it's very easy for uh, people to just say a few words and then a lot of, you know, the justice system uh, rolls into gear and a whole bunch of consequences ensue. Um, but the, you know, I feel like where it comes from is if you're the judge on the case and you have to choose between potentially exposing children to a violent father, uh, whether it's actually happening or not, you don't know the real reality inside that house because you don't, you're not watching it 24 seven. But I think that judge doesn't want the potential for violence weighing on his or her conscience. And so That's they will right. always do the precautionary thing. However, as with everything, there's balance. There's a flip side, you know, removing children from one of their parents, whether it's the mother or the father over the long term has consequences that damages the children. One of my previous guests, Linda Nielsen, she showed how in many, many studies all around the world across different time periods, children do better on average in two parent households than on one parent household. They do better in school. They don't drop out as much. They're more socially well adjusted, less right. likely less likely to get into gangs, less likely to become addicted, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these benefits of um, either a two parent household or after a divorce, if they have equal shared parenting, uh, the children having contact and physical custody with both parents is better than completely cutting one parent out of the picture. But the right. judge is very rarely looking at those costs and those consequences when they're making this decision about what to do with, uh, you know, this particular case of violence, right? In my chapter, uh, I really, uh, I really worked hard in this chapter. I worked on it during the COVID, uh, the first uh, phase of the COVID epidemic when everybody was kind of locked up in their, their homes. So I, I really focused on it and uh, really worked hard on, on kind of thinking through sort of a way of thinking about how to decide, you know, the amount of custody and, and then the amount, if any, of treatment in cases of domestic violence and allegations, you know, trying to balance the safety of the children with uh, the rights of parents and, uh, you know, the, what you just said, the children benefit from having both parents in the home. And uh, just, you know, just trying to do, do so in a way that's based on the evidence. And so, one of the things that I pointed out was that um, it is possible for there to be uh, domestic violence against the mom, let's say, where the children don't witness it. They don't witness it. And uh, furthermore, the dad is pretty charming and is actually okay with the kids. Like, you know, but the kids can love dad because he's right. And they don't see him hitting mom, but he could be abusive to mom and, and call her names and hit and intimidate her. That does, that can happen if, if I find a case that where the facts are like that, then I'll recommend only supervised visits and I'll recommend intensive treatment for the, for the father. Now there has to be, of course, the facts have to line up with that. Okay. So it's not, the, it's not necessarily, the, it's not necessary for there to have been a violence that the children directly observe. It could have been behind closed doors. Why is that? Because, because there's a, there's a, a lot of, um, research showing that 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 moms who are abused and i'm talking about severely abused you know high, highly controlling behavior serious violence that leads to serious injuries in a chronic way over time when women who are mothers who are subjected to that kind of violence um becomes become stressed out they develop symptoms of ptsd and their parenting abilities are compromised which affects the children so the way I look at it is if whatever the violence is or the dysfunction, if it's directly affecting the children and there's a way to stop it, let's correct it. If, if the original problem is dad's previous violence on mom, um, that we need to correct that. Now, you might say, well, they're divorcing, they're moving on. So, 
know, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that if the kind of dad that would do that kind of, that would commit those kind of behaviors towards mom in the past is likely to do the same to his new wife or new girlfriend, putting the children at risk. So there are situations, I think they're fairly rare, but they're, they're, they exist where, you know, I might actually recommend that, that a dad, um, you know, be restricted in, in, in uh, his custody because of those reasons. But most of the time, vast majority of cases that involve domestic violence in the family court uh, involve what we call situational violence. There is no, there is no pattern of, of coercive control. There's just couples who don't get along. That's the reason why they're getting divorced. Now, there may have been some physical, you know, violence, pushing, grabbing at some point in the relationship. I mean, I, the vast majority of cases that I get where dads are uh, trying to get the, their kids back and there's accusations of domestic violence. I mean, in the mass, vast majority of cases, the accusations are no, no more than, you know, two or three or four instances. Maybe, you know, he, he got angry with him, he was drunk and he threw a glass against the wall and it came back and hit me in the leg. And then on other occasions, he shoved me and that happened like four years ago. I mean, those are generally the most severe uh, accusations. I sometimes will get cases where more severe violence is alleged, but generally speaking, um, these cases involve allegations of lower level, infrequent, conflict-driven abuse as opposed to abuse that's part of a chronic pattern, personality-driven type of domestic violence. Not saying it doesn't happen, but it's... Um, so what judges need to be taught is that most domestic violence is lower level, it's high conflict. Once the couple break up, it's like, okay, so what are we worried about? The reason why they fought is because, they, you know, they weren't compatible. As long as there's no evidence that the parents have been abusive to the kids, they're okay. Well, where I have a problem and what I'm concerned is if the parents' violence is driven by personality, then there's a chance that that would be carried out to the next relationship. And that's where I think it's really important to, uh, to have treatment. Okay, a batterer's program is supposed to be for a batterer, and not every man who's been abusive to his wife is a batterer. A batterer is a, a guy or a woman who's been abusive over time and who's controlling. And there's a pattern, a chronic pattern. Now, it's, it doesn't emerge from conflict so much as it's just the way they are. It's their personality. There's a big difference between the two. And judges have no idea you know, that the two are different. They just see this is a as a homogeneous phenomenon. It's all the same. The same consequences for everybody. Right. So that's a very important distinction, and I'm glad that you that you made that point. Um, I just want to like kind of take stock of where we are so far because I want to come back to the PASC project. So the gender paradigm. It seems what I've learned both from this discussion and from the conference is that because many of the speakers at the conference they made this point um, that violence inside a home is often reciprocal. Uh, it's often part of a family violence system uh, that involves man and woman, husband and wife, or in the, ca in the case of same sex, you know, the two partners. Uh, and it's often intergenerational. It's because the people who are violent grew up witnessing violence and they internalized the idea that this is normal, this is somehow acceptable. And so they replicated those behaviors when they got into relationships as adults. And it's not, you know, it's not uh, most of the time a tool of political control. It's kind of a, an aspect of the interaction between nature, nurture and culture in, in, a, in a network effect, you know, across generations. And, in a, and, you know, many people who they themselves are violent they kind of attract violent partners. In well, that's sense. that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, yeah, I was well, I, I was mentioning uh, Alexandra Lysova. She at Simon Fraser. We were we were talking about um, we were talking about you know homicide cases where women kill their male partners, and the assumption by a lot of battered women's advocates is that they generally do so as a way to fight back. Um, after years of being abused, well, the research shows that's just not true. Now, there are women who, there are women who are liter literally fighting back, uh, who have been. But m much of the time, these women were violent all along. Now, here's where it gets complicated, uh, Warren. There are cases where 
the record shows, the police records or the um, other records show that only that when she killed the guy, there had been a history of violence by her husband against her. Well, so my question is, okay, but we know that most domestic violence is reciprocal. In most relationships where there's been domestic violence, about 60% of the time, according to one of the PASC reviews, uh, both partners were violent, bi-directional. So if the records shows that she had been abused by him in the past, my question is, well, in, in what context? Context is everything, okay? Was she, was it bi-directional? Was she violent as well as him? And also, if, the, if there was a pattern of unilateral violence, let's say by him, well, was there a pattern of uni, uni, unilateral violence by her at some point? Sometimes it goes back and forth. And also, when did the violence stop? Because if he was violent five years ago and has been violent since, um, and you're pissed off at him for some reason, you kill him, the fact that he was violent in the past is irrelevant. So, you know, sometimes um, the more we know about intimate relationships and what, behind, what happens behind closed doors, it brings up even more questions. So, uh, you know, I'm just trying to be honest about it. Um, you know, I've worked with, I've worked with prosecutors in helping them put violent women behind bars in several murder cases. You know, I had four murder cases or attempted murder cases, and they ran the whole gamut between a woman who was really abused and, and women who were just total uh, sociopaths. You know, one case, the woman, um, the woman shot her boyfriend five times. He, he managed to live, but she really tried to kill him. She shot him five times in his bed while he was asleep. But she had a history of being abused by him. And furthermore, his two ex-wives went on the stand to say that he had not only beaten them senseless, but had threatened to kill them if they ever left him. These were real threats, and there were third parties who were willing to testify to that. So I recommended to the prosecution, you know what? Um, if there's a way that she can be convicted on a second-degree murder charge or, mis or a aggravated manslaughter, that would be more appropriate. Was she immediately uh, in danger of being killed that night? No, it wasn't strictly self-defense, but that would be a classic case of the battered women syndrome where the woman actually not only believed she was in danger if she left him, but there was evidence that he, had, that he would carry out that threat, right? Now, at the other extreme man had a woman who shot her boyfriend in the back 15 times and uh, because he had called the police on her <laughs> and she was pissed off. And, you know, even her own mother testified that my daughter is a sociopath. So, you know, uh, and, but some of the cases in between weren't as clear cut. You know, there was one case where the woman killed, she knifed her, her, her boyfriend. He had a history of being abusive to her, but she had a history of being abusive to others, including him. She'd been arrested for assaulting a clerk at uh, Kmart. Um, and furthermore, the reason why she stabbed him is they were arguing, it was his house, he wanted her to leave. She didn't want to leave because it was too cold outside. One thing led to another, so she stabbed him. So, well, she killed him because she didn't want to be cold. Also, she was jealous because he had a new girlfriend. Well, how's that bad, being a better woman? Yes, she could say that he had been abusive to me, right? But here's the case where in context, the fact that he'd been abusive to her in the past was almost irrelevant because she'd been abusive to him and on the night in question, she wasn't afraid of her life. She just didn't want to go out in the cold. That was her motive. Her motive was, you know, you can't tell me what to do and you can't kick me out of your own house if I don't want to leave. That was really what it came down to. So, um, so I'm giving you kind of a sense yeah. of the complexities of how these, when these relationships really go wrong, what can happen. It's not always either she's a better woman or she's, she's a total psychopath. Sometimes it's really hard to pin it down. And I think that's why the judicial system has a, a series of choices that can be made regarding sentencing. I think at a minimum, what we can both agree on is every situation should be evaluated based on the facts and evidence and the context and history of that situation. We shouldn't enter into any judicial process or legal process with some pre-existing ideology, whether it's pro-male, anti-male, pro-woman, anti-woman, anything like that, or, or political, you know, it should just be, you come into it, you listen to all the evidence by all sides, and based on that, you come to a conclusion as to, you know, what to do about it. Uh, at a minimum, that's, that's how I would hope our justice system works, but it doesn't, off, doesn't always work that way. 
Well, I try to certainly uh, advance those principles in my own work. Um, you know, I, I have, I'm not a, I'm not a batter, I'm not a uh, men's rights advocates per, advocate per se, but I'm sympathetic to many of their causes. And but some of the batter, some of the, um, some of the uh, men's rights advocates will sort of frame family court situations in their own kind of way. Like uh, the assumption is that. When allegations of domestic violence are made, it's generally a woman who's just using the court to get uh, kids and she's alienating. You know, not every case where you think she's alienating is, is there really alienation. And maybe the kids don't like you right now because you, you're kind of a jerk. Uh, or you just don't happen to get along with your teenage daughter. It doesn't mean mom's alienating her, you know. So I think all sides can, 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 uh, can easily fall into those traps where they start exaggerating things for, for their point of view. I try to be, you know, very even-handed. I probably had as many cases involving truly badder women where I was trying to show that that was a factor in the case uh, as I have men who have been falsely accused. So I, rep I can represent both sides, but I've often turned down cases after a 15, 20 minute consultation on the phone. I've, I've sometimes not taken cases because I just thought, you know, I would really have to lie or I'd have to compromise a lot of my principles to to help this person in this case here. Um, yeah. It's one of the sad things to me, though, when we t talk about all these issues is how people, adults, uh, you know, whether it's a father or a mother, they use the children uh, as a tool in order to, like, take revenge against their ex, you know, or the person that they're currently married to. Someone could be a bad spouse but a good parent like that is definitely possible right absolutely we, we have to keep that in mind and someone whether it's a father or a mother could be abusing their spouse they could be violent against their spouse but they they have never even done a single incident of violence against their own children and in that case you know perhaps the relationship should end they should move out but that's not necessarily an argument for saying you don't get to see your children again for the rest of your life. Like if they haven't, if they've been a good parent and there's a track record of that, you have to take that into consideration. Well, with the caveat, uh, as I explained a little earlier, in extreme cases where there's a really chronic, serious pattern of battering, I would be concerned about the children's safety in the long run, simply because of the impact that dad's uncorrected behavior might have on the subsequent partner that the children in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, maybe in a secondary way, the children would be affected. So, uh, like, think about it. Do you, would you want, let's say the children never witnessed anything bad that dad ever did. And dad never hit the children, treats them really well. But dad rapes mom. He just rapes mom. And he's just a violent thug and just very, very uh, uh, sociopathic. Would you want the children really around that dad? Because at some point, you know, you see what I'm saying? There would be exam there would be some some examples where uh, perhaps uh, you would want to look into that. But I agree with you in general. In general, um, yeah, I think the courts um, are too uh, you're too quick to take away dad's rights simply because of the possibility that there's violence or there may be more violence. Um, again, to me, the 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 deciding factor is typically personality and chronicity. If there's a personality disorder and there's chronic violence and abuse, I'm more likely to recommend a, a pumping the brakes on, you know, returning custody to dad until dad's shown that he's changed his behaviors. If there's not those things, if there's just allegations or even it's been shown that dad has been situationally violent from time to time, and it's because in the context of an escalated conflict, then I would usually would recommend something like do an anger management program, do some treatment, maybe have a couple of supervised visits, and then we go to unsupervised. And we quickly bring the children and the, and the father back together. There, there, it's not inconsistent to say, you can have the kids back 50% of the time, as you normally would, after, say, two or three months of an anger management program. Uh, and you, you, know, you need to continue with the program until it's completed. Uh, that to me is a way to err on the side of caution. You know, if I'm a dad and I really want to be with my kids and I, you know, I have been aggressive and I have blown up at my partner on a few occasions, then I would want to, you know, resolve that problem. It's not good for the kids. Um, and if that means that in order to get my kids back, I have to spend a little bit of money 
in a couple of months of counseling. I, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. I think um, it, it only makes sense. But like you say, it's, it depends on the context, it depends on uh, the, the chronicity, the severity of the violence. And every case is different. I can't, I can't tell you that it, whenever I write a report, my recommendations are completely 100% um, correct or accurate. Sometimes I, I'm wrong. So there's no way of knowing sometimes because I don't follow up with these cases. But it's certainly possible that, um, that I may have been a little too flexible or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. with these cases. I, it's hard to tell. Right. So the, um, the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project, this is a very ambitious thing. It has a website, uh, by the way, that people can go and check it out, domesticviolenceresearch.org. Domesticviolenceresearch.org, right. On this site, uh, on the landing page, what you describe is that it was a, pro a project done by about 100 people from 20 universities and research centers. And it was published in five issues of Partner Abuse Journal, um, 2,657 pages. That's impressive. All the major research on domestic violence since 1990. So now that's about a 30 year cumulative history of research and 1700 peer reviewed studies. So that's a huge body of knowledge internationally collected over a period of three decades. Um, can you tell us about the this project? What like how did it all come together and what were the I know it's a we could spend hours just going through the findings, but Maybe well, there were some things that are kind of the big, broad lines of what a, a, a non-expert in this area, like a general layperson, should know that yeah. you discovered during this process. So in, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, so, so the reason why I, I initiated this project is because, um, you know, I'm still not a professor. I'm not a professor. Uh, I'm not an academic. I'm a researcher, I'm a clinician, I'm an, and I, I do forensic work. And I am an expert in the field, obviously. But I'm not a professor. I have a PhD, but I'm not a professor. So what that means is that I don't have access to most of the peer-reviewed journals where you know, research on domestic violence is published. You would think that I would. Um, obviously, I have access to my own journal, uh, published by Springer Publishing. I also have access to another journal called Violence and Victims, which is also published by Springer. And of course, I can use Google Scholar, but most articles on Google Scholar are not, you know, you, you can't, they're not available. They, you can see the, the reference, but you can't publish it and you can't print it out. So, um, so I thought, you know, when I was starting out in the early 90s doing my clinical work with batterers, um, the only way that I was able to get any kind of peer review research was to go to the uh, to go to UC Berkeley, not too far from where I was living in California. Go to UC Berkeley and pretend to be a student, and go into the you know into the library, and you know pick find the journals in the, in the stacks in the library and then print it out. And I had to pretend to be a student. Now uh, I was able to you know gather enough research to publish my first books and articles that way. Um, now that I have, you know, I, I know a lot of researchers, I can just, you know, I can just email them and say, hey, do you have this article? And they'll send it to me. But think about it. I'm one of the world's leading experts in the field. And I've written books on the subject, 50 articles and book chapters. But I have, I'm not able to get the articles unless I go, have people do it for me. So it made me think, how am I going to persuade my colleagues who are battery intervention providers who are very uneducated about domestic violence, for example, most of them tend to buy into the gender paradigm. How am I going to get them to get the facts if they can't have access to the journals? So I thought, you know, I, 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 need, to, I need to make the research available in a way that everybody can access, access it. So this is how the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project came in. I asked a bunch of colleagues that I know hey, let's, let's do the research on all the available information. Well, maybe, maybe not all of it, but all the important topics, 17 different topics on domestic violence. And let's research uh, this in depth. And here's what I did that was different. Here's why, why PASC is different than most literature reviews. There's lots of literature reviews on different topics in domestic violence. The difference here is that every single reference that was cited in, in each of the journal articles uh, was summarized in a table 
So the, there are online tables at the website you mentioned that summarize the important information about that particular article for each article cited so that, uh, in, in the original manuscript. So out of the 2,657 pages, probably 60% of that are tables. Why did we go to the trouble of doing all that? Because of transparency. We wanted transparency. You know, earlier you mentioned you referenced Murray Strauss uh, in his article talking about how um, uh, how researchers sometimes shade the truth or they, you know, they kind of reference each other. Um, what they do sometimes is they present their findings, and then in the conclusion section, the conclusion section says something other than what the findings actually say. There's a very famous uh, article um, that looked at motivation why how are men and women who are abusive how are they motivated why are they why do they do what they do poco kern smith was the just singling her out but there was there's been others so basically her findings were that uh, men and women are pretty much equally likely to to be violent in order to control their partners the conclusion section only men are controlling of their partners like in direct opposite to her own finding right and then you have the phenomena of selective uh, citation, where the researcher only cites, uh, you know, the journal articles that support their point of view. Michael Johnson, you probably have heard of him, is an example of that. Michael Johnson came up with these categories of domestic violence, the difference between um, intimate terrorism on the one hand and uh, situational violence on the other. Very good. That's a good contribution to the field. But we maintain that coercive controlling violence or slash uh, uh, intimate terrorism is really a male on, on female phenomenon. Now, he would cite one of the early research studies from John Archer and Nicola Graham Kevin in the UK. That's, that early study of theirs was based on a sample of, mostly a sample of battered women. And they did find uh, that intimate terrorists tend to be males. But that's because it was based on a sample of battered women. They went on to publish dozens of articles on new studies that they conducted with a broader population, a more representative population base of subjects, and found that men and women are equally likely to be intimate terrorists, based on Johnson's definition of what an intimate terrorist is, which is someone who's controlling, psychologically abusive, and physically violent. And long after they published these articles, Michael Johnson in his latest articles, he retired eventually, would still only cite those early articles. I sent him an email telling him, I think you, you, know, you, you may have neglected these, you know, these articles by your citing the early research, but here's some of the newer research. I've sent him the articles and he completely ignored them. There's only one explanation for that. He's lying and he's got a political agenda. It's really that simple. So because I know that some of the researchers have a political agenda, um, I decided that with this partner abuse data knowledge project, we would have complete transparency. Someone reading the, uh, the, 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 a particular manuscript, particular uh, article, um, who had some, who was wondering about some of the references, maybe was skeptical, you could look up, look up the tables. Now you can all, you know, ultimately they could always look up the original articles. But even if you're not a researcher and you don't have access to all the journals, the tables that we provide are pretty clear. You know, it includes the number of subjects, um, the the methodology that was used, you know, uh, and all the results that came out. So, uh, so that was my that was my, my that's what motivated me to do this. Is I just wanted to have the information out there in a transparent way. So that everyone could access it. Now, the Partner Abuse Student Knowledge Project um, was published. The articles were published in 2012 and 2013. So now it's been 10 years, and I'm in the process right now of having most of the same researchers do an update. So sometime in 2024, we will publish another three or four or five uh, special issues of the journal with uh, with the, the updated tables updated manuscript so it's an ongoing it's an ongoing project okay. and i'm glad you asked about it it's, it's really the it's really unique there's nothing like it anywhere in the world mm -hmm. yeah so it's um it i believe uh, you said it's the world's largest domestic violence research database 
Yeah. Um, so there's a well, lot NISVIS, to dive into there. Yeah, NISVIS is good too. The National, the National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey is, is pretty good. Um, but let me just tell you something that's interesting about NISVIS. So National Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence Survey, I think they sample like 30,000 Americans. Really well done. Um, so when, when the, the first uh, articles were published based on that data on the, CD, on the Center for Disease Control website, they presented, they presented the data, the way they presented data was generally favorable to the gender paradigm. It was kind of like, well, we find is that um, domestic violence is very common and women suffer the most. And then they would cite, it, when they cited their results, they would show that women um, are raped more often than men, they're stalked more often. And what they would do is they would, they would combine certain findings, certain categories of findings. For example, when you, domestic violence can be physical aggression, psychological aggression. Psychological aggression can be divided into two different types. One is expressive violence, which is when someone is calling someone names, versus instrumental uh, aggression, uh, instrumental uh, psychological abuse, which is more actually controlling behaviors like, you know, standing in front of somebody, not letting them leave the house and so forth. So, so you, have, you have physical aggression, uh, expressive psychological abuse in that instrumental psychological abuse, and then you have sexual abuse, and you have, uh, and then you have stalking. Okay. When you come... I looked at the data. They didn't publish it, and they didn't they didn't cite it. But I looked at all the tables. I added up the the number of uh, reported uh, victimization incidents by men and women overall on all the categories. And men were more victimized than women in general. When you when you take all the categories, what they do is they cite they they combine the categories that would show that there's more female victims. Why why do they do that? Um, because they have an agenda, but they weren't able to completely whitewash it because this, this, they couldn't ignore their own findings. So subsequent publications have made it clear, you know, and I'm just saying the way, the, the way if you, you have, to, but you have to kind of dig into it. Like if you just read the headlines, you'll get the impression that, oh, domestic violence against men is, is kind of a rare phenomenon. So, um, but I'll, having said that, um, politics aside, it's a treasure trove of really good data. Uh, one of the things that they do show, it's pretty obvious, is that uh, when it comes to the impact of domestic violence on victims, women do suffer more. So if, if they're going to describe, say, intimate terrorism as experiencing physical aggression, psychological aggression, and injuries, and whether or not you call the police and seek help or go to the hospital, then yes, yes, that's a fair way of characterizing, um, you know, intimate terrorism, and yes, there are more victims uh, of intimate terrorism that are female than male based on those parameters. Okay, but that's not what Johnson originally described intimate terrorism as. He described intimate terrorism as uh, the use of physical aggression and psychological abuse. Yes, when you add the impact, then yes, you have. So that's why. We have to be precise. So when people ask me, do you think domestic violence is the same between men and women? I say, no, it's not the same. Women are more impacted. But if you're asking about motivation, risk factors, rates of violence, psychological abuse, all that stuff, controlling behaviors, yes, it is the same. I, I know I, I'm being, I may be overly pedantic about it, but um, I think it's better that, I think it's better to be a little bit more informative with too many facts than that people can sort of sort out on their own and figure out, make their own conclusions. And it is to try to oversimplify the data and, and risk being uh, misleading to people. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is a complex topic, which is why I think one of the reasons you did that whole project is to put all the data out there and collect it in one place so that anyone around the world can go and read the original sources and they can come to their own conclusions. I think um, yeah. like one of, my organization's goals uh, is to just broaden the discussion. We are not denying, uh, you know, male on female violence in any way. 
we're just saying that's not the only form of violence. There, there is that. There's female on male. There's male on male, female on female. And you have to look at everything. Don't just look at, you know, one thing from one angle, but look at everything from multiple angles. And then you get a, a picture of what the world is like. Exactly. And, um, you know, especially if you're concerned about children, I think you don't want to uh, ignore certain types of violence because you're more uh, you're more fixated on other kinds. Because if children are exposed to any violence, you know, even if it's coming from the mother, they're they're learning things. You know, they're they're witnessing things that may make them possible victims or perpetrators in the future. Um, you know, many times, I, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the things the conference taught me was that in, in many of the cases of reciprocal violence between father and mother, uh, the woman hits first or she initiates it. Uh, sometimes she hits first, sometimes he hits first. But It's about 50-50. Yeah, so if, if it's approximately balanced, then um, society turning a blind eye to women who initiate violence uh, even if you don't care at all about men, which I believe we should care about men intrinsically, but if you didn't care at all and you just cared about women, you know, she's more likely to become a victim later on because That's many right. of those men who are hit, some of them will just stop and walk away and they will say, I'm not participating, but some of them will hit back. They will. And right. so she is exposing herself and others to violence by instigating it. So like, it's, it's really like we should stop all violence. That should be the the broad global goal, in my opinion, is, you know, regardless of who starts it and who continues it, let's let's understand the dynamics and stop all violence so that we can have a future without it. I'm with you. Yeah. Um, we've been talking a long time now, almost two hours. So uh, I know it's it's getting a little bit late, but I really appreciate how you're, you've been generous with your time. Um, maybe we can just come kind of to a conclusion here, uh, but I want to share the websites once again with our audience uh before i give you a last chance to kind of make your final statement you have your own website which is johnhamel.net yes and we have the pask project which we mentioned domesticviolenceresearch.org and partner then you abuse also have state of knowledge past p-a-s-k no. partner abuse state of knowledge uh domesticviolenceintervention.net is another website uh that i believe you founded uh and contribute to DomesticViolenceIntervention.net is the organization website for the Association of Domestic Violence Intervention Providers that I founded. We are a network of individuals who provide, most of us are licensed therapists, who, not all of us, but we all provide services for perpetrators of domestic violence. And we are located in 20 different countries, mostly the United States and Canada, but a fair number of people in Europe and some other places in the world. Uh, we're having a conference on October 12th, October 12th, a six-hour uh, conference on the Zoom platform that I wanted to plug, October 12th, Wednesday. Uh, you can register now. Uh, this conference, the focus of the conference will be, it will be focused on, uh, on legal and intervention reform in the area of domestic violence. And many of the speakers are people that contributed to my most recent book. I just edited a book with my colleague, Brenda Russell. Uh, Brenda wrote one of the definitive books on battered women's syndrome and its adjudication in the, in the court system. Uh, the book is called Gender and Domestic Violence, Contemporary Legal Practice and intervention reform. It's published by Oxford University Press. There's 15 chapters in different uh, different areas of domestic violence uh, in the law and treatment, including I mentioned before a section on uh, on family law. We have a couple of attorneys contributing chapters to it, and a number of researchers. So as I said, some of those researchers, including myself, will be presenting uh, at, at the uh, October 12th conference. So I urge your uh, your listeners to uh, to check it out. You can the, the way that you enroll for the conference is to go to the Advip website, which again is domesticviolenceintervention.net. Uh, and the book is available through Oxford University Press. It just came out. 
And I'm very Absolutely. proud of the book. It's my. It's probably my. Uh, the work. The, the book that I maybe spent the most time on. Uh, when I was hunkering down during the pandemic, I just I came up with this idea of having a book that summarized the research on domestic violence in terms of uh, you know legal issues like we, we were we've been talking about, both in the criminal side and the family court side, and this and a, a, a book that would be of value to practicing attorneys. The book is primarily for practicing attorneys. Who want, who need to be educated about how to competently uh, litigate cases that involve domestic violence. It's also intended for practitioners, program directors, and so forth, and obviously for policymakers whom we want to influence in, in some kind of way. So, uh, but I appreciate the chance to talk to you about these these different topics. It's a, uh, you know, I don't come from an abusive background. I fell into this top into this field by, by accident. One day, I, my, my colleague who was sharing office space with suggested that I take over his anger management groups. I just needed the money and I started doing it and one thing led to another. And I have no, I have no skin in the game, so to speak, no ideological, you know, bent, nothing to prove. I'm uh, just the kind of person that's just generally skeptical. I'm a skeptic, I'm kind of in, really independently minded. I value learning, I value the truth, and I try to apply those principles in my work in the field of domestic violence. So I appreciate any time I'm asked to talk about this topic. I think it's an important one. It's a very important topic. Well, John, thank you very much for your time. And uh, I will put all those links that we mentioned, including to the conference and the book, in the description to this video when we put it online. So everyone can uh, join those and join the event, buy the book, etc., and read more about it. Um, it's been a pleasure. I really appreciate you sharing all of your wisdom and insight on the topic. So um, thanks and enjoy the rest of your evening. I hope we get a chance to speak in the future. Stay in touch, Warren. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.